Welcome to my Parsha share this week uh, is Parshat Yitro. It's a very, very important Parsha in Parshat Shem, in Sefer Shemot when the Jewish nation receives the Torah. We're going to be talking about receiving the Torah because there's a little bit of ambiguity here. Was the Torah given to them or did the Jewish nation receive the Torah? We're going to come to that later because, of course, we know that we always refer to it as Kabbalat HaTorah. Well, obviously, we look at things from our perspective. We received the Torah. But the description in Parshat Yitro is much more of God giving the Torah. So which one is it? Is it God giving the Torah or is it the Jewish nation receiving the Torah? I'm going to leave that question hanging for you. I'm not going to answer that question quite yet, although during the course of this year we're going to look at two different perspectives and we're going to describe what happened at Mount Sinai in such a way that we can make some sense of this ambiguity of giving the Torah, God giving it, and us, the Jewish nation, receiving it. Let's begin with this week's Nesivas Shalom. I know I don't do it every week, but very often I refer to the Nesivas Shalom. This is quite a short piece for the Nesivas Shalom, who sometimes can run off onto three, four, five pages, sometimes even more. And uh, usually I take a section of the Nesivas Shalom. This week I don't have to take a section of the Nesivas Shalom. It's just about a page. And if you want, um, I have posted a PDF online. You can print it off and you'll be able to see it for yourself. I'm going to go through it not in its entirety, but I will cover all the bases as to what it is the Nesivas Sholem says about this particular topic. And listen to the angle that he uses to uh, engage us in this subject. How do we introduce the Aseret Hadibrot, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments in the Torah? The Ten Commandments are the essence of us receiving the Torah. So when we say we received the Torah at Mount Sinai, we didn't actually receive the Torah in, in the sense of the Torah scroll that we're familiar with that we take out of the Oran HaKodesh and read from every Shabbos, because much of that material was not yet written at that stage. What we received at Mount Sinai was the Aseret Hadibrot. Everything else was added on by Moshe Rabbeinu, who wrote it, um, some of it immediately after Kabbalat Torah, some immediately after the revelation at Sinai, and some of it uh, was uh, con it was continued, as it were. It was written along the period of time during the forty years they were in the wilderness, and it was completed just before they entered into Eretz Israel. And we know that at that stage, Moshe Rabbeinu wrote it down. Besides, for the last eight pesukim, the Gemara says that those pesukim were uh, either written by Moshe Rabbeinu um, in anticipation of his own passing, but uh, probably in the more likely explanation is that they were written by Yehoshua bin Nun. They were written by his uh, primary disciple, Joshua, who took over the leadership. And those last eight pesukim were written by him at that stage. But what's important for us today, in terms of understanding what we're going to be describing the the narrative, as it were, the narrative section of the Torah dealing with Mount Sinai and the revelation at Sinai, is that what we received at Mount Sinai, what was given to us by God at that stage, was something that we refer to as the Aseret Hadibrot. It's always translated into English as the Ten Commandments, although that's not what the word Dibrot means. Dibrot actually means sayings or statements. And the technical term for it in biblical terminology is the Decalogue. The Ten Commandments were received by the Jewish nation at Mount Sinai, and they were introduced with this pasuk in Parshat Yisrei. And God spoke, Eskol hadvarim ha'ele, all of these things, Lemoir, what does the word Lemoir mean? You've heard that word many, many times, right? There's so many psukim in the Torah, which are Vayedaber Hashem El Moshe or 
El Moshe Vel Aaron, Lemoir. I remember in the uh, when I went to school as a youngster, we used to learn in Yiddish, Azoi Tzogun. That's what we used to say. Lemoir means Azoi Tzogun. Um, in the English translation, it's mistranslated as saying. That's not what it means. Lemoir means le amar to say so that it should be said it should be repeated azoi tzogen so when Moshe Rabbeinu was given a mitzvah when God told him a mitzvah he says to him by Dabe Hashem that's how the Torah records it God spoke el Moshe to Moshe lemor so that he should repeat to the Jewish nation that this is what the mitzvah is so the Nesiva Shalom has a very good question yesh das we really need to understand what's going on here. Why do we need to be told by the Torah that God said all of these things? Well, obviously he said all of these things. He didn't say only half of them. If this is what's recorded as, the, as what he said, then that's what he said. He could say, And the next question is, why do we need the word lemo? Listen to this question. It's a beautiful question and it's a fantastic platform for the discussion that we're going to have today in this year. Hare kol klal Yisrael mikoton v'ad godol ho yubamamad har Sinai. Every single Jew who was alive at that time, from the smallest and to the biggest, from the youngest and to the oldest, Every single Jew, man, woman, and child, was at the foot of Mount Sinai. When all the seven heavens split, and every single person who was there at Mount Sinai saw that there is no other God besides for the God that we refer to as Hashem. Every one of them heard the Ten Commandments. All of them were there, and they all heard all the words that were spoken. If we say that Lamar means that this is something that needs to be repeated, who exactly did it need to be repeated to? They were all there. Now, when Moshe Rabbeinu heard a mitzvah, uh, you can't expect all the Jewish people to know what God says to Moshe Rabbeinu on a private one-to-one -one basis. So therefore it says, Vayadabe Hashem el Moshe Lemo, because he needs to actually tell the Jewish nation that which God had spoken to him, which was for their benefit or for that something that they needed to hear in order that they should know how to conduct their lives. That makes a lot of sense because they didn't hear it yet. So he needs to say it to them. But in this situation, where the entire Jewish nation was hearing the Aseras Adibros, what is the point of the word Lemo? Why do we need it? Why do we need to have it repeated? It was said once, we heard it, that was it. We need to understand something else that it says in Dvarim, Dvarim Perik Dalad, Raki Shomelecha, Ushamoy Nafshecha, Ma'oid, Pentishkach, Esad Dvarim Asherau Einecha, Upenyosuru Milevavecha, we need to understand something very, very important, says the Nesiva Shalom. In Devarim, which we know as the repetition of that which, was, uh, which appeared elsewhere in the Torah, although that's not quite accurate, as I've said in many Shurim over the years when I look at Devarim. But nevertheless, broadly speaking, Devarim is a rehash, it's a summary of everything else that had already been contained in the Torah. And it says, Raki Shomelecha, make sure that you protect yourselves, that you look that you are very careful. And guard your souls. Ma'oid a lot. Pentishkach esadvarim, in case you forget the words Asherotwecha, which your eyes saw, Upenyosuru Milvavecha, lest it uh, go out from your hearts, Kolyamechayecha, all the days of your life. What exactly does that posuk mean? The Kosher says the Nesiva Shalom. When did Dvorim happen? You know the history. I mean, you're all familiar with the history of the Torah. When was the Torah given? When was the Aseris Adibris given at Mount Sinai? Immediately after they came out of Egypt. When is this everything that's contained in Dvorim? When did that happen? 40 years later, right? 
that's when it happened. Roughly 40 years. It wasn't quite 40 years later. Almost 40 years later. What happened during that period of time? Well, you know what happened. There was a terrible story of the Meraglim, and all the Jewish people were condemned to die in the wilderness because they participated in the story of the Meraglim. They agreed with the Meraglim and they were crying and they said, we want to go back to Egypt. And God said to Moshe Rabbeinu, this is not a nation that can um, take part, participate in the conquest of the promised land. It will have to be their descendants, those who were not involved in the story of the Meraglim, which happened after uh, Kabbalah Satora, but in that same year, it cannot be that they will be the ones who will inherit the land. It will have to be their descendants. And all the Jewish nation, this is what we have as a tradition, on Tisha B'Av night, they would go to sleep in a, a grave that they dug for themselves. It sounds very macabre, but they would dig a grave for themselves. Some of them would wake up in the morning, some of them wouldn't, and they would die, and they would be buried there in a grave that they'd already prepared for themselves. By the time Moshe Rabbeinu was speaking to the Jewish nation in Devorim, there were no longer any adult people who were alive, who were present at Mount Sinai. All the adults were, at that point, if they were alive, children under the age of 20. They weren't at Mount Sinai. Now let's look at the Posuk again. It makes no sense. The Posuk makes no sense. It says, halolu. Sorry, the Posuk says, Raki Pentishkach es hadvorim asher ro'u einecho. You shouldn't forget the words which your eyes saw. Who's he talking to? He's not talking to anybody there. Most of the people there weren't at Mount Sinai, didn't see the words. They weren't able to participate at Mount Sinai because they weren't there, they weren't alive. Or if they were, they were little children and weren't conscious of what it meant to be at the foot of Mount Sinai. They didn't have that sensitivity to the spirituality of the occasion. So what's he saying? That they need to remember. These words were spoken by Moshe Rabbeinu at the end of the 40-year stay in the wilderness. All the uh, generation of those who left Egypt had already passed on. Only those who had been under the age of 20 those who remained alive at that stage, Muhammad Har Sinai, es Kabbalah Satorah. They did see Kabbalah Satorah. In which case, all the other people who were there, when Moshe Rabbeinu gathered them together before he died, had not seen anything about Sinai, hadn't experienced the incredible um, communion between God and the Jewish nation at Mount Sinai. So why is he speaking to them as if they did? And we need to also understand we need to understand something else. The Torah is actually an eternal Torah. That's the title of this year. The eternal Torah. How do we understand this concept of the eternal Torah? It is something that is eternal for generation after generation for all generations. But if it's, if it's very specified, if Moshe Rabbeinu is saying to the nation just before he dies, you know that these words, you have to be very careful about them. Make sure you're, which words am I talking about? The words which you uh, were witness to at Mount Sinai. Is that Nitzchius? Is that eternal? How, how exactly is that eternal? They weren't at Mount Sinai, so they could say, ah, oh, Moshe Rabbeinu is saying, if you were at Mount Sinai, you participated, you witnessed Kabbalah's HaTorah. You witnessed God giving you the Torah. Therefore, you have to be very careful to take uh, heed of the words of the Torah. What if you weren't at Mount Sinai? Ah, then you're free to go. Then it's not important for you because you weren't there. How do I know? Because Moshe Rabbeinu himself said it. Your eyes saw it. My eyes never saw it. So I don't have to bother with it. The other question, which is a side question, is why do you have to guard yourself twice? The word shomar is used twice in that pasuk. What is the implication? That's the foundation of today's shir. He uses this, the Nasiba Sholem uses this as a fantastic way, a foundation, to understand what went on at Kabbalah Satorah, at Mount Sinai, the revelation at Mount Sinai. Yesh, 
v'yesh lahavin al yisoy divrei hazoya hakadosh. Let's understand it on the basis of something which was said by the Zohar, the text, the very famous, the most important kabbalistic text of Jewish tradition. Madakosu b'shir haseyom v'yoimru leimayr. So the word Lamar also appears in Oz Yosher. Okay, just before it says um, Oz Yosher Moshe of Nei Yisrael Sheh Azois, um, it says Lamar. What, what does the word Lamar there mean? What's the context? Says the Medrash, sorry, says the Zohar, Ledore Dorim. Lamar for all time, for every generation, for every generation, this song is important, not just important, it is being sung in every generation. Of course, we know that uh, on a practical level, that's the reason we say Oz Yosher every day at Shachris, because it's Ledore Dorin. It's not something that they sung then when they came out of the Yamsuf. It's something that is sung every day by every Jewish people, person who davens Shachris. We say Oz Yosher before the end of Psuke de Zimra. But it has also a mystical meaning. Ledore Dorin. Vahainu Shechnisu Koyach Ba'amirosam Ledore Dorois. That which was sung by the Jewish nation when they came out of Yamsuf gave strength, somehow had an impact. Somehow it involves every generation that was subsequent to it. It didn't um, start and end on the shores of the Yamsuf. It's something that started then and continued it reverberate. It is echoed throughout Jewish history. Ledore Dorin, Ledore Doris, Leimoy. It's not just in this world, it's also in Olam Haba. The words of Oz Yoshir are so profound and so important and so unique and, uh, in fact, so impactful on what it means to have faith in God that they didn't end at the end of the song. They finished singing and they went on with their lives. But that song continued to ring in the ears of the Jewish people for all time. That's the idea. The power, the strength of these words of the song is something that was eternal for every generation. The whole concept of song, of being able to sing, the fact that we have Pesuke de Zimra is only because at that moment in Jewish history, when they were saved by this incredible miracle of the splitting of the Red Sea, they created this possibility that every Jew for all time will be able to sing Shira. If that's what the Zohar says about Oz Yosher, how much more so? That the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, which were uttered at Kabbalah's HaTorah, if, if Oz Yoshir created that possibility, if the dynamic emerged from singing Shira at the shores of the Red Sea, how much more so that that possibility was created by what happened at the revelation at Sinai, by the words that were uttered by God that we call the Aseras Adibrois. Shedvar Hashem Aseras Adibrois, loyo dibrochad pa'omi l'shatai. You should know that the words which were uttered by God at that moment, they weren't just said then and there, just for then. It wasn't just about then. Not at all. Elo dibor nitzchi anem al-oilom. It is something which was eternal, which was said for all time. It applies to all times and it can be heard. At, that's what he's saying. This is the Chiddush of the Nesiva Sholem. That the words of Aseris Hadibrois can be heard for all time. As it says in the Posik, is a Posik in Yeshaya, in chapter 40 in Perik Mem, Udvar Eloikenu Yokum Loilom. The word of God stands forever. What does it mean the word of God stands forever? So the ordinary interpretation of that would be that it's something that lasts forever. But that's not the way the Nesiva Sholem is, is uh, interpreting it. He's saying the word Yokum means that it can be heard forever. It is forever being uttered. It echoes and echoes again and again. Have you ever heard an echo? It's an echo that bounces from one place to another, to another, to another, to another. And, you know, seconds, are, for us it's only a second. It can be up to half a minute or whatever it is. But we can hear that echo and it's clear 
you can hear the sound of what it is that someone says or the noise that was made. You can hear it clearly. But imagine this, that Dvar Elohim, Yokum Elokeinu Yokum Na'olam. The word of Hashem is Yokum. It bounces and bounces and bounces and bounces and bounces backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, echoes and echoes and echoes and echoes. Can you hear it? Can you hear the word of Hashem? You could hear the word of Hashem as it was uttered at Mount Sinai. That's the concept of Nitzchius. That's what the Nesiv Shalom says. And in understanding what this means, we now understand that that the Aseres Hadibros, even though they were said at Mount Sinai, specifically, they are being said all the time. Did you say the bracha this morning of, of Birkas HaTorah? It's a very important bracha. We say it every morning. Do you know what the bracha is? We end the bracha twice. Baruch HaTorah Hashem, Noisein HaTorah. We make a bracha because we want to be able to study Torah during the day. So we make that bracha. How do we end it? Noisein HaTorah. Giving, he's giving the Torah. Baruch HaTorah Hashem, Noisein HaTorah, the giver of the Torah. Doesn't make any sense. He's not the giver of the Torah. He gave the Torah a long time ago. 3,300 3, and something years ago, God gave us the Torah at Mount Sinai. What should it say? He says it here. It says, Asher Nosan HaTorah, who gave us the Torah. At some point in our early history, at that foundational moment of Jewish history, we were given the Torah at Mount Sinai. So what should the bracha be? Baruch HaTo Hashem, Asher Nosan HaToyra. That's not what we say. What do we say? We say Noisein HaToyra. De Nesinas HaToyra hi nitzchis udvar hava tomid. You need to know that the giving of the Torah by God is something which is eternal and in the present at all times. Shakodesh Baruch Hu Noisein Tomid Es HaToyra L'Amo Yisrael. God is giving the Torah to the Jewish people at all times, any time. What, what time is it now? Look at your watch. Now, right now, God is giving you the Torah. Look at your watch in five minutes. Right now, God is giving you the Torah. Now we understand what it means. <coughs> what, what does it mean that God is giving the Torah? Or that all these words of the Aseret Adibros, he's saying, Leimor, as I said before in Yiddish, that they should be repeated. What does that mean? It means Hainu They will be said for all time. Not that you need to repeat them. They will be repeated. Leimer. They will be repeated at all times throughout Jewish history. The Jewish nation will hear the words of the Aseres Hadibros because they're being said. es kol hadvarim and that's why it says the words. Es kol hadvarim All of these words. Merame shegam hakoylois. There was a lot going on at Mount Sinai. It wasn't just the words. It was everything that surrounded. The kol means that kof lamed. It means everything. It's not just about the words that were said. You know, sometimes you go to an event and there's an atmosphere at the event. And because there's this atmosphere at the event, it makes it very special. And later on, you try and repeat everything that you saw, heard at that event to somebody who wasn't there. And they're listening to you and they're watching what you're saying. Uh, they just don't get it. Why? Because they weren't there. And there's no way that you can recreate the atmosphere of that event. Unless you were there, you didn't experience it. Do you know what it means? As kol hadvarim ha'ele, this is what the Nasiba Shalom says. That all the loud noises, the thunder, the lightning, the, the uh, incredible special effects that accompanied the giving of the Torah, that's also something that is forever. Hard for us to understand, but that's what he's saying. He's saying that there's some eternal quality to the atmosphere of the event, Sheheim Chelek Mi Kabbalah Satora. They are part of Kabbalah Satora. They are as important as the words on the page that we read in Parshas Yisroi. They are no less important. They created the atmosphere, the platform for this essential moment of our history, and therefore they're still there. And he says, and it's well known 
It's something that we know in our folklore. Shebe'es shelomat ha-Bal Shem Tov ha-Kodosh im Talmidov ha-Kodoshim that the time that the Bal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, used to study with his Talmidim, ho-yushoimim eim hesakoilais u-varokim she-kodmu l'mamat ha-Sinai. The legend has it that they could hear the loud noises and the banging and all the accompanying noise that had uh, happened alongside the giving of the Torah. That's the legend that somehow they could sense that as well. It wasn't just the words of Torah that he was saying. They had a sense of the majesty of the pomp and the ceremony of the noise of the moment of Harsinai when the Baal Shem Tov would learn with them. And that's why it says it's also the kol, the everything part of the giving of the Torah of the Aseris Adibrais, the accompanying atmosphere that is lemo, that is for all time the doire doiris. Kol mashe nema venire oz le rabbi sakoilus vabrokim. Everything that uh, was included in the moment of the giving of the Torah, including all the noises, lemoi le doire doiris, would be said, would be repeated, would echo for every generation thereafter. Kol ze nema tomit. Oche. Let's be clear. Everything I've just said, everything the Nasiba Shalom has just said, only works for somebody who has purified themselves to the ultimate level of purity and purification, self-purification. You can't experience the Torah, you can't hear the Aseras Adibras, you can't hear those echoes unless you're worthy of hearing them. If you have purified yourself, if you've reached that level of spirituality, then you're able to hear the Aseras Adibris. So we know that the disciples of the Baal Shem Tov, they were worthy of this, and therefore they heard it properly. Now we understand what the Posuk means in Devarim. When it says, Hishomer lecha, guard yourself, Ushmoi nafshecha ma'oid, and take care of your soul very much, Shepirshu ha mefarshim di Hishomer lecha koyal aguf. The mefarshim, the commentary say, what does it mean, Hishomer lecha? That means guard your body, your physical, material self. Shemoi nafshecha ma'oid, al ha nefesh, that you need to guard your soul, you need to take care of your soul. You know what the word sig means? You need to make sure that you get rid of any worthless rubbish in your soul. That's what the word sig means, dross. Or fagam, anything that prevents you from achieving holiness. In case you forget those words that ra'u enecho, that your eyes can see. Your eyes can see. Not that those people at Mount Sinai saw. That your eyes see. You have the possibility. You're part of the Dore Doros. You are part of all the different generations that are subsequent to Mount Sinai that can still hear the words of the Aseres Hadibros. If you are able to um, clean out your heart and soul, every side of your being, every part of who you are, from anything that prevents you from being holy, if you're able to do that, if you're able to achieve that level, then you'll not only be able to hear the words of the Aseris Adibris as they were said at Mount Sinai, you'll be able to experience being at Mount Sinai. You will be there. That's your possibility. That is an ability that you have. You will be able to experience that which was experienced by those who stood in front of God at Chorev at Mount Sinai. That is something that's within your grasp because it's happening right now. You'll be able to tune in. The radio station is available. You just need to have the correct frequency to be able to hear it. He says that there's a beautiful piece in Degel Machne Ephraim, who was a descendant of the Baal Shem Tov. What does he say? The, um, there is a Mishnah in Ovois 
There's a Mishnah in Pirkei Avos, in Perik Vav, B'chol Yoyim Baskol Yotzeis Mehar Chayrev. Every single day, there is a heavenly voice that comes out of Mount Sinai. Is anybody at Mount Sinai? Has anybody here been to Mount Sinai? By the way, if, even if you go there, do you think you'll hear the Baskol? But the Baskol is there. Every single day, there is a voice that emerges, a heavenly voice that talks about our duties and our obligations as Jews. That happens. Shehiksha and the Dego Machne Ephraim asks a question. He says, Mimonavshach. Let's look at it from both angles. Why don't we hear the Baskal? We went to Mount Sinai and we don't hear it. The Im ain't Shomim Isa, And now that we know that we don't hear it, why is it that there is this baskoil from Chayyab? What's the point of a baskoil if no one can hear it? What's the point of a voice in the wilderness if there's no one there to listen to it and to take heed? And he says, you know what? You've got to get something clear. There's something which is pre-recorded in our spiritual psyche, in our spiritual DNA which can hear everything holy that God says. And there are times when we are very sad with the way our lives have been conducted and, every, and everything that we've done and we're sorry about and we want to do Teshuvah, we want to repent, we want to go back on those things, we want to get closer back to our relationship with Hashem as it should be. He said, you know where you draw your strength from? Where's that energy coming from, that spiritual energy? It's not coming from your day-to-day -day life, because your day-to-day -day life isn't that. That's why, of course, you need to do teshuva. So where are you drawing that spiritual energy from? Where is that source of spiritual energy? Do you know why? Do you know where it's from? It's from the baskel that comes at Har Chayrev on a daily basis. Kol yoim, baskel yotzis me Har That's what it says. Vim omnam agufa nefesh enom shoimim esa baskel, even though... Your body and your soul don't actually hear that baskel. You don't have the frequency. You're not able to tune in. Nevertheless, You should know that there is somewhere very deep inside you, inside your spiritual DNA, which is conscious, subconsciously, of that baskel, can hear it, and that's what's propelling you to do the right thing and to do teshuva. But you need to tune in to the bus girl to get there. Ukamoi Shah Baskal Yoitzes Mehachoyrev Mavia his Eurus Lakolb Klali Stroll. And seeing as we know that this bus girl, this heavenly voice that emerges from Harachoyrev from Mount Sinai, is able to generate enthusiasm for Tshuva for all of the Jewish nation. Harivadai Vachoshekain. It is certainly all the, all the more the case that the words of Hashem that took place at Mount Sinai that are eternal, they are forever. And the Aseris Adibrois, the Ten um, Commandments, which are said forever, they bring his iris, they generate this spiritual enthusiasm for every Jew. And all the, you know, sometimes you have this idea, I want to do a good thing today, I want to do a mitzvah, I want to, I want to be a good person. Where's that coming from? Why would you even think that? Why is it bothering you that you're not a good person? Where does it come from? All the time that you have these ideas that I want to improve myself, I want to improve my life, I want to be a better person. He says, do you know where that's coming from? It's like Yeshaya said in Perik Dalad in Yeshaya. That these words of Hashem are Yokum La'olam. Aseris Adibris are there. They're somewhere. You can't hear them subconsciously, even below your subconscious subconscious. You're somehow tuning into the Aseris Adibris. And they are like a beacon. They're like a homing device. They're bringing you back to where you need to be, to where your neshama needs to be. Shetomit hu noisin because at every stage of your life, God is giving the Jewish people the Torah. And if a Jewish person is able to take care that he looks after his body and soul in the proper way, in the proper fashion, he will merit 
to all those things which the eye can see and does see of which they saw at Mount Sinai. They saw this incredible miracle that took place, the revelation of God at the, the Aseris Adibris at Mount Sinai. I want to say that everything that we've been talking about till now is looking at it from the perspective of the Nasibus Shalom. Nasibus Shalom, the bottom line is that the giving, the giving of the Torah is eternal. The giving of the Torah is eternal. That's basically what he's saying. But there's another way of looking at it. Because the truth is, it's hard to understand that something that took place at one particular point in Jewish history has this eternal nature. I want to look at it from a slightly different perspective. And you, we know in the last few months we've lost many great people in the Jewish nation. We've lost many great rabbis and teachers. Only this week we lost two great Rosh Hashivas. We lost Rabbi Shulam David Soloveitchik, Zichat Tzadik Livrocha. We lost Rabbi Yitzchak Shaina, who was the Rosh Hashiva of Kamenetz. Two great rabbis who died this week. And we've lost many great rabbis over the past few months. I've spoken already many times about uh, Chief Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, and uh, we've brought him up in uh, many of the talks that I've given, the shiurim I've given, and the articles I've written. I want today to focus on Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz. He died a few months ago. He was very elderly, but he was an incredible um, force for good in terms of Jewish learning across the Jewish world. And he was hailed as a great scholar. Of course, he came from a secular background, but he became a Balchuva. He was very close to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He taught himself to speak Yiddish. He taught himself how to study Gemara. And he learnt many different things in Nigla and Nister. I want to share with you an article that he wrote. It's an incredible article, um, which can be found, I think, on Chabad.org. I've reworked it for this year, so you're going to forgive me for that, and hopefully he'll forgive me in Shomayim for doing that. But I'd like to share it with you, because I think it gives a slightly different perspective. So this is the article. It's uh, an incredible piece, and I'm sure that once you've heard it, you'll understand why I wanted to say it. It's an essay titled The Eternal Torah, it's adapted from an article by Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz, Zichrona Levracha. The festival of Shavuos, which was the day the Torah was given to the Jewish people by God, is also called, as we've said already, Kabbalah Satorah. It's referring to the fact that this was the day that the Ten Commandments were received by the Jewish nation. And it would seem to be a natural pairing of concepts. Simply speaking, giving and receiving are two sides of the same action, and it makes sense for them to be interchangeable as descriptions of the event. But truthfully, they're not identical. Each of them has its own particular meaning. In Jewish mysticism, in the Kabbalah, the giving of the Torah is a movement from above to below, while the receiving is a movement from below reaching upward. And in the dimension of time, the giving of the Torah is essentially a single act at a particular moment in time, while the receiving of the Torah is a diversified and continuing process throughout history. Now, before expanding on this point, let's clarify what is meant by the word Torah. To translate Torah as law misses the mark completely, even though the Bible, the Torah, could rightfully be seen as a book containing laws and moral instruction for living. On the other hand, this aspect of instruction, teaching us how to lead our lives, is certainly basic to Torah. As without Torah, we would just be a mo the Torah would be a monumental work of literature, nothing more. Besides, Torah that is not a living framework for action is no longer Torah. Therefore, the giving and the receiving of Torah is more than just the transmission of a certain body of information. It is the communication of a message that causes a profound change in the thought and behavior of those who receive it. It is also clear that Torah constitutes a bridge between God's divine essence and man. Now, the actual giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai was a very dramatic and awesome event with heavenly voices, there was trumpets, there was lightning, there was thunder. And you could wonder a little at all the fuss, considering that the Ten Commandments are no more 
than fundamental rules for the conduct of any society. In part, at least, similar ideas already found in the older law codes of Babylon, of Egypt, India, China. Therefore, it must be the case that the full weight of the Ten Commandments is not only just about their content, but actually in the special way in which they were given. Which means, for example, that when the Ten Commandments says, you shall not murder, this is not a law set by some local chief to avoid vengeful blood feuds. As a result of all the fuss that accompanied the giving of the Ten Commandments, we know that it is the command of an almighty God. And this is what gives it real power and real meaning. To transgress any of the commandments of the Torah is primarily to defy God. And only after that is it an offence against society. But this is only a relatively external, formalistic aspect of the giving of the Torah. More significantly, the giving of the Torah is an act of from above to below. It's what we said, the Kabbalah says. The crossing of the infinite gap between God and the world. There's no way man can cross that gap. As a human being, one can only cry out in despair. What has he, God, got to do with us, the dwellers of the dust? And of course... This aspect of the giving of the Torah is not a modern thought. It's repeated often in the Torah itself. And it's probably a basic experience in all religions. It would actually seem to be the case that this is the inner message, actually, of the Ten Commandments. Namely, that they are an answer to this feeling of man's insignificance. It is a central aspect of the confrontation between God and man at Mount Sinai, as the Pasuk says in Dvarim, Behold, God, our God, has shown us his glory and his greatness. There's We have heard his voice emerge from the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God does talk with man and he lives. The importance of this encounter as described in this Pasuk is not in the actual words spoken by Hashem but in the fact that Hashem, that God, appeared before man and told him what to do, that God established some sort of contact with man. And this is the meaning of the whole Torah. All the rest is commentary. Consequently, the giving of the Torah is a single historic event in which the divine is the decisive factor. The receiving of the Torah, by contrast, is an enduring process in time, with man as the decisive factor. The paradox is only resolved when the two movements meet. This is exactly what Chazal mean when they say, basing themselves on a Apostolic in Yeshaya, that when the Jewish people are not God's witnesses, God is not God. In other words, Israel has to be ready to bear witness to the divine presence, which allows the encounter, the revelation of the Torah, to take place. And again, it's not the content that's important. It is that someone is ready to receive it even before knowing what it is. Na sevenishma. This becomes the decisive factor. The receiving of the Torah is therefore not just a matter of passively listening to the message of the Torah. It's an act of committing oneself to absorbing the poetry and the principles and carrying out the commandments throughout one's life. To begin with, there had to be a certain receptive state of mind, what we call the Naseh Nishma moment. We shall do and we shall hear. In order for the Torah to be given, on the other hand, the inner meaning of this formulation of readiness only became evident later, as expressed by what Moses said 40 years later when he was about to die. In Devarim it says as follows, he said to the Bnei Yisrael, God didn't give you a heart to know and eyes to see and ears to hear until this day. Only many generations later could it be said that the Jewish people had developed a heart that was able to know the Torah, which was designated for them. This idea is not just a metaphorical way of saying something. It is a recurring theme throughout the Torah itself. You could say that the whole Torah is a detailed account of all the conflicts and reconciliations in the process of receiving the Torah. Time is needed for any truly revolutionary teaching to be understood, and there are any number of intermediate stages. 
in the entire history of the Jewish people. It was only during the time of the Second Temple that the nation as a whole finally accepted the Torah as an obligatory way of life. From that time on, until recent generations at least, there was no serious division between the Jews and the Torah. They have been one consistent entity. Think about it. I mean, really think about it. It's a stunning fact. More than a thousand years passed between the giving of the Torah and the total receiving of the Torah. Of course, it's not simply a matter of the spiritual, intellectual capacities of one generation or another. As long as we possess free will, the problem of receiving the Torah will be revisited for every individual in every generation. But the point is this, the process of receiving the Torah has continued from the incident of the golden calf of the Egel Azov all the way through Jewish history until today. It is the process of training each Jew to genuinely absorb what is being offered to him. The giving happened already a long time ago, but the receiving, it's happening right now. And receiving the Torah is never a straightforward learning process. It's always being obstructed and delayed. And interestingly enough, those obstructions and delays are not just the result of diverse kinds of rejection. They also reflect the many forms of inadequate or premature acceptance. After thousands of years and countless good intentions and incessant struggle on the part of generation after generation of devout Jews, we can only be sure of one thing. The Torah once given at Sinai continues to be received by the Jewish nation and will continue to be actively received by the Jewish nation until the moment of final redemption. Bimheira, Amen. Thank you. We'll leave it here for today.